Okay, excellent. So thank you first to Jeff and Jerry for helping invite me and, and certainly to the big four uh, universities helping organize this. It's a great idea. And I'm, I'm super happy to be able to participate and, and talk today about TEM. So hopefully what I can do with this talk is, is give you a sense of how you might fall in love with transmission electron microscopy. And as we talk about the technique itself, the applications, we'll also talk about some of the downsides. And like some good relationships, you'll, you'll see why it grows into a love-hate relationship. Um, so here you can see a little picture of some whining and dining that's required to keep your TMs running in good, good, good order. Okay, so the outline of my talk is very simple. Uh, this is a very basic introduction to TM, which is a fairly complicated technique. Um, so I'm going to give you a brief introduction of the technique, just discuss some of the relevant topics. We'll talk a little bit about the instrument and the components inside of it. We'll spend a bit of time talking about how images are actually formed inside the electron microscope. And then hopefully we'll spend quite a bit of time talking about the different things you can do with a, a TEM or in this case, when we say STEM, we're talking about a scanning transmission electron microscope, which can also be used in TEM mode. So. so the basics I want to talk about, I talk a little bit about the equipment here. At the end, we'll have a slide that talks about all the TEM STEM equipment at the different big four universities plus NC State. So I'll, I'll go through that pretty quick. Um, give you a link to some resources, different textbooks that are very useful for the beginner going into TEM. Um, try to convince you that TEM stems are very powerful tools that you should, you should care about and, and talk about why you should care about. And then give you a one slide history of scanning and transmission electron microscopy. So like I said, we, we have some equipment here at NC State. We have three different TEM stems. Uh, we have an older Joel. We have a aberration corrected Titan, which has several bells and whistles attached to it, uh, including a pixelated detector for 4D STEM applications. And I'll show you some examples of things we can do with those. Uh, fancy monochromator, fancy EEL system, fancy EDS system. So uh, kind of fully loaded probe corrected system. And then our newest microscope is a Talos, uh, which is kind of our in situ platform. We have the full suite of probe chips in situ holders. We have Pico and Dinner, straining, cryo, bulk heating, uh, a full range of in situ stuff that we, we typically use the Talos for. Um, so, so that's some shameless self promotion here at the analytical instrumentation facility at NC State. Um, some textbooks, which you'll find very useful again if you're a beginner. Uh, the most common one is typically what's called uh, the Williams and Carter textbook, which is just TEM. They have a new edition that came out about 10 years ago. Um, another one I found very helpful for students is an older textbook by Eddington, uh, which is last published in the 70s. Uh, you can typically find that in libraries or at least a PDF of it somewhere. Uh, that, that typically is a very good resource, especially if you're getting into diffraction. Uh, and then Jim Howe's book at uh, UVA with, with Fultz, uh, that's actually a very good resource as well. So. Uh, and there are many more, Reimer's textbook and, and other textbooks that go into more depth about the optics, certainly. But uh, these are good beginner resources. Okay, so why should you care about STEM or TEM? Uh, and the, the very brief answer is it's one of the highest spatial resolution imaging techniques in our toolbox. What I mean by that is if you go to an instrumentation facility like the analytical instrumentation facility or any of the electron microscopy labs at the other big four universities, you will find various electron microscopes and the TEM or STEM will always be the highest uh, spatial resolution imaging technique in those facilities. Um, there, there are very few other techniques that approach the spatial resolution of a TEM, especially a probe or image corrected TEM. So spatial resolution is kind of like money. You can't really ever have enough. Um, so the more spatial resolution that we have, the smaller the things we can see. And we'll talk about that in, in just a second. Um, the other benefit of using electrons is that they are very strongly coupled to all matter, protons, other electrons. And what that means is that we get a lot of signal out of a piece of matter, an atom or many atoms, when we illuminate them with electrons. And these different signals we can start to collect and it, they tell us different information about our sample. And I'll, I'll go into that a little deeper in just, just a second as well. And 
as a material scientist, one of the big advantages of something like TM or STEM is that we can start to study materials at the, what I call the fundamental link scale of the material scientist, which is the atom. Um, we can start to look at atomic structure, atomic chemistry, and atomic bonding, and try to figure out, of course, what we call these structure property relationships. Where do the properties of our sample come from at the atomic link scale? So TM gives us access to to the atomic link scale, certainly, and certainly atomic chemistry, atomic bonding. Um, so it's a very powerful tool in our toolbox. And hopefully I can convince you of that. So, But before we start talking about applications, let's talk a little bit more about resolution. So uh, Evans Analytical Group and now EAG Eurofins, they always publish this kind of chart, which has a lot of information on it. You'll see various techniques in these little bubbles, um, mass spectroscopy techniques on the right side, up at the top, you have imaging techniques. And on the x-axis, you can see that this is what they call analytical spot size, or we can, we can relate that to resolution of our imaging system. And you can see that TM and STEM are pushing the resolution further out than any other imaging technique, at least in this chart. And now this chart is not necessarily uh, very recent. I think it was last updated in 2013. If we update it to include things like aberration correction in STEM systems, we can see that we can push the resolution of STEM, TEM um, for imaging and some of our spectroscopy techniques such as EDS and EELS out to very small resolutions, sub angstrom resolutions now. Um, so again, that's resolutions like money. The, the more you have, the better, the better off you are. So TEM and STEM have extremely high resolutions. now. This may be a bit basic, but a lot of people, uh, when I teach a class to undergraduates and graduates, they conflate resolution and magnification. So if we def we need to kind of define what is spatial resolution or what is resolution in general, and we can define that in kind of a pictorial sense where we have, let's, let's call these two atoms separated by some distance, and we can visually see that there's two atoms there. So we, we our imaging system has enough resolution to resolve these two atoms when they're some distance apart. As those atoms start to get closer together, we can still resolve that there's two with, within the resolution of our imaging system, but it's some distance apart, that distance falls below the resolution of our imaging system, and now we resolve those two atoms as one. Even though there are two atoms in that space, we just can't resolve it. Now we can also look at some simple math, and this is for diffraction limited optics only, meaning we're ignoring things like aberrations and other incoherent sources that will decrease or diminish our resolution. This is kind of the best case. What is the resolution or the distance between two points defined by? And we're going to ignore this, this factor here. We're going to look at the, the constants, and that's going to be wavelength of our imaging system and then something that we typically call the numerical aperture, which is kind of the angles that are allowed to enter, or in this case, we'll call our objective lens. Um, so it's a fairly simple equation, and you can see that the smaller we make our wavelength, the smaller the distance between two points we can resolve, which kind of gives you a very simple idea of why we move to electrons from photons, because the wavelength of electrons is incredibly small. And then we can start to think about things we can do in our optics optics to increase or, or decrease this number, uh, sorry, increase this number to uh, decrease D. So now that that's spatial resolution and typically is very different than magnification. And, and people may bristle at this, but magnification is relatively meaningless. In the real world, something like this, we, we may generate an image in our microscope and there, there is no zoom and enhance. We can keep increasing the magnification all we want, but if the, so I should back up a little bit. If we look at this, you may try to convince yourself that there are two objects in this little blobby thing here. Uh, mathematically, we can say that there's only one because if there were two, the space between those two is below, it's smaller than the resolution of our imaging system. So no matter how much we zoom and enhance, we're not gonna be able to make out that there are actually two objects there because we lack sufficient spatial resolution. So you can see if I, I pull my real world zoom and enhance, we see nothing, there is nothing. To actually resolve that there are two structures there, or two atomic columns there, we need to increase the physical resolution of our imaging system. 
So in this journal, in this paper, what they did is they actually changed the electron source. But I think it's a pretty illuminating ex example, no pun intended, of you know resolution and magnification are quite different things. So um, now, looking at this very simple equation for diffraction limited optics, one of the things you may think of is well, just keep decreasing this number, right? That will allow us to go to smaller and smaller spacings between, in this case, atoms. And yes, that's a great idea. And you can see a plot of wavelength of the electron versus accelerating voltage out to 1 million volts. And so there are microscopes that go up to millions of volts. In this case, this is a, a 2 million volt microscope in Toulouse, France. Um, you can see the size of it. So the operator is using it kind of like a, a marionette here to control apertures and deflectors. Um, the building itself that houses the microscope is quite large. <laughs> Um, and the whole facility is pro enormously expensive, I'm sure. So in these days, going to higher and higher voltages, yes, will give you more resolution, but it's probably not the answer you're looking for unless you have unlimited budgets. Uh, these days, what you're looking for is probably what's called aberration correction. So this is kind of the definitive example of spherical aberration correction. Uh, this was the images generated by the Hubble Space Telescope when it first launched. It actually had a defect in the main mirror assembly, which gave rise to a high degree of spherical aberration. So the images of, say, a galaxy uh, were actually worse than ground-based telescopes. And so they had to do a, a space mission, uh, sorry, a, another orbital mission to install a corrector on the main mirror. And then after they did that, we started to get the classic Hubble Space Telescope's images that were far superior to ground-based telescopes at the time. Um, we can install similar spherical aberration correctors inside modern TEMs. And to give you a new kind of stark example of the improvements possible um, in resolution, in spatial resolution. So this is uh, two different microscopes, one that's what's called uncorrected and another that is spherical aberration corrected or probe corrected system. And you can see this is the same sample, uh, not exactly the same area, but the same exact material. And in the uncorrected microscope, you can kind of make out atomic columns, very blurry, kind of a mess. You can see there's two different structures in there. Uh, the spherical aberration coefficient here is in the order of millimeters, which is related to the focal length of the lens. And then after we correct most of those spherical aberrations in the, in the condenser lens, you can see very clearly the atomic structure of that sample. And we've now gone to spherical aberration coefficients in the microns. So we, a pretty dramatic drop in aberrations gives us quite a huge rise in resolution of our imaging system. So that's typically how we're, we're increasing the spatial resolution of our imaging systems these days. I'm not gonna go down that rabbit hole just yet. So um, let me talk about the signals. I mentioned that one of the reasons we use electrons and electron microscopes is we get this wealth of signals out of our sample when we illuminate them with electron beams. Um, so in this diagram, there, there's quite a bit of a explosions going on here. We have our incident electron beam. You know, typically we call it a high KV beam of you know hundreds of thousands of electron volts hitting our sample. And then we get samples that we call backscattered signal which may be backscattered electrons, but these are generally signals that come out of the surface and, and go up the electron column 180 degrees from, from the electron beam up to 180 degrees. Um, and typically in the TM world, we don't use too many of these other than the X-rays these days, though you will find microscopes with secondary and backscatter electron detectors. Uh, those are increasingly rare. Typically in a TM, what we're gonna use are the transmitted signals because we it's a transmission electron microscope and all of our detectors are typically below our sample. Um, so we get quite a few different transmitted signals and we can kind of define those in terms of the, how they're scattering, whether it's elastic or inelastic. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. We can start to define them based on the angle of that scatter, whether it's high angle, lower angles. And again, we'll get more detail there in a little bit, but you can see there's tons of signal coming out of our microscope, tons x-rays, electrons, scattered electrons out to different angles, different different energies. So it, there, there's a huge wealth of signal. And in a modern TM, we're going to make use of basically every part of the electron. We're going to try to collect everything, but again, basically the secondary and max scatter electrons. 
So we get a lot of signal and that signal is going to tell us something about our sample. And I'll give you at the end, we'll talk about applications where we'll show all the different kinds of signals we can collect and what information they tell us about our sample. Now, in very brief, we can collect the, some of these different signals contribute to things like images, diffraction, spectroscopies, whether it's energy loss or energy filtered in the TM mode, uh, EDS, where you collect the x-rays, all of these things tell us about either the structure, chemistry, or bonding of our sample, the kind of the three pillars of structure property relationships. Um, and again, I think it's better as we get to the end, I'll show you some examples of all these different signals and what information we can get. But, but there's, the point here is there's a lot. Now, in one slide, a you know, I'd be remiss not to talk about a little bit about the history of TM. TM is the oldest electron microscopy technique. Typically, we, we talk about how it was invented around 1929 when Ernest Ruska's PhD thesis. And then basically in 1931, we, we consider the first TM to be built. And then if we look, I'm not going to go through this in any real detail, but you can see there's periods where the resolution effectively doubles every 10 years. Um, Back in 1999, we were at one angstrom as part of the one angstrom microscope project at NSIM. Uh, I guess it was an NSIM at that time, but and then 10 years later, we've doubled the resolution. If we go to 2019, we cannot, we haven't quite doubled the resolution. There are reports of, you know, around 30 picometer resolution, so close, but there's been other major improvements in things like the energy resolution of the spectrometers and other things that have improved TEM. And of course, in 2017, TEM won another Nobel Prize. The first was in 1986 um, for cryo-TEM techniques. So the history of TEM is, is, is quite robust and it's still developing every, you know, every 10 years, we're seeing massive improvements in, in resolution of the microscope. Um, that will probably fall off for technical reasons, but there are other improvements that can be made, certainly, so. Okay, so what is a scanning or transmission electron microscope? What hardware do we use? How are images formed and what signals are generated? And this is gonna be very basic. You could spend many months on any one of these topics. So I'm gonna to try to give you the, the kind of 10,000 mile view of, of TM here. So forgive me and please ask any questions. Um, that I don't cover in any great depth here. So if we summarize the TM in kind of one slide, it's we have an electron source and there's many different types that the electron source determines the performance of the microscope. We generate those electrons, we accelerate them to reasonably high voltages, somewhere between 20,000 and 300,000 uh, electron volts these days. We use lenses and deflectors to focus and shift the electron beam around on our sample. Uh, when we're doing TM imaging or when we're operating in TM mode, we're generating an image and actually projecting that image onto some sort of viewing device. When we're operating in scanning transmission electron microscopy mode, we're actually rastering a very small probe over our sample and generating signals that we integrate to form images or other data. It actually operates very much like an SEM, very similar principles. If we ignore 99% of the optical components of an electron microscope uh, and compare them to a light microscope, what you'll see is a light microscope and a TM are actually incredibly similar in, in terms of their components and their operation. We have some sort of illumination source here. We'll have an electron source and a light source here. Uh, we have a condenser lens to collimate the electron beam and project it onto our specimen. Uh, we have an objective lens to form images and then we have some sort of projection system to magnify and project the image onto our eye or a CCD or a fluorescent screen or some other imaging device. Um, so the components and optical properties of the TM and in light microscope are actually quite similar. An SCM or a STEM actually is substantially different. They do have very similar lens, lens components, excuse me, but what we're doing is we're shining a very small probe onto our sample and then generating some sort of signal that we're uh, detecting and integrating. So this is the diagram of SEM. If we add a transmission component, all we have to do is add some sort of annular detector or a different detector, doesn't have to be annular, some sort of electron detector below our sample that can collect signal and integrate it. Um, so I'm sure many of you have used SEMs that have transmission detectors, just like ATM. So there are SEMs that operate just like stims, and there are stims that operate somewhat like SEMs. So 
Um, but it's a very different principle in that we're not generating image. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but the focus of this is mostly TEM for now. Um, if we look at a more complete picture of, uh, I would say a somewhat more complete picture, this is still missing about 67% of the different components of a TEM or STEM. Um, but a modern or fully loaded TEM has quite a bit going on. Um, we may have a monochromator to increase the energy resolution of our system. We'll have an electron source, an accelerator, we'll have a condenser lens stack. We may have a, an image corrector for the condenser lens. We'll have an objective lens somewhere where our sample will sit. We'll have perhaps another image corrector and this time for TM images. We'll have some sort of projector system. We'll hopefully have some sort of energy loss spectrometer and not visible here, but we'll have some sort of EDS system attached to our, 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 our microscope. Um, what's not shown here are the deflectors, scan coils, stigmators, the multitude, again, about two thirds of the microscope is, is schematically missing here that actually allow us to do what we do in the electron microscope. Um, and then over here on the right, I'm not gonna talk about these. This is the Themis cubed at Rice University and some of the different uh, materials and applications they were doing with it during the, the install. So um, you're welcome to ask for the slides. I'll be happy to send those to you. You can look at those in a little more detail. Um, if we look at kind of the ray diagrams of a TM, kind of the using all the different lens components, um, you can see that there's quite a few lens components. And again, we're missing about 50% of the different elements here. Uh, the reason why we have so many lenses is to increase the versatility of the microscope. Um, in the old days, the very old days, we had dedicated TIMs or TMs and dedicated STEMs, and there was not any good way to do STEM in a TM or TM in a STEM. These days, the microscopes are designed so that you can operate the microscope in transmission electron microscopy mode, scanning transmission electron microscopy mode, energy filtered mode. You can form nano beams. You can do very low mag imaging. You can operate in, in it's a hugely number of different, a large number of different configurations because we have full control over all these different lens elements. So basically the, the complication of a TM how complex they are also gives us incredible versatility in what we want to do with a microscope. And I really like this roulette wheel of electron micro transmission electron microscopy. Um, so what this is, is basically we can break up techniques and in TM into something like imaging, diffraction, spectroscopy, and then we can start to branch off of, you know, basic TM imaging, basic STEM, STEM imaging, basic EDS, basic EELS. And then there's variations of different ways of using the optics and the components of the microscope to do specialized applications. Um, bright field, dark field, weak beam, dark field, holography. There are, it's a, and, and of course this is outdated the day it's published because there's now 4D STEM techniques and DPC and a million other techniques um, that can be added to this wheel. Uh, but th there's a lot you can do within a single platform. And, you know, the, the way a TM lab manager picks which technique to use is we take a dart and we, we print this out and we throw it. No, I'm kidding, obviously. But um, it's an overwhelming number of techniques that we can do in the microscope. So one of the good things that, you know, one of the things we always try to teach is what can you do in a TM and what can you not do in a TM? And at the end, we'll talk a little bit more about what we can't do, or at least the things that are very difficult. Um, but the point here is that there's a lot we can do in the TM because we have a lot of versatility, which ri gives rise to some complexity in terms of aligning and operating the microscope. But uh, the versatility, is, it's very similar to optimi optical microscopy. There's a lot we can do. Now, how, how does it actually work? <laughs> how, how do images come out of the microscope? So, and this is the part where I'm waving my hands like a bird. We, we're flapping very vigorously here because to cover the full range of image formation in the TM is basically a one year course, if not a little longer. So I'll try to do my best in a few slides uh, to very briefly summarize um, electron optics and electron interaction with matter. But what we're looking at here are a couple different diagrams. We have our, our sample sitting inside our objective lens. The optics above the sample are designed in TMO to generate some sort of coherent, parallel, planar illumination. So we're, we're illuminating our sample with kind of a, a, a wave, a planar wave of electrons. 
they all have a uniform phase, ideally. They're all, they're all related. Those waves pass through our sample. They interact with the atoms inside our sample and they scatter and they interfere with each other. And then we get some sort of exit wave outside of our sample where the intensity is gonna be changing depending on what's inside our sample. And that's again, big hand waving things. You know, if we have different atoms, and we'll talk a little bit more about this or defects or other things, we may see changes in intensity, which will show up as, you know, in this part, this may be bright in our image and this part may be dark in our image. So we'll, we'll see that. So that our image is formed and changes in intensity are related to some of this interference or scattering inside our sample. If we look at the back focal plane or our diffraction pattern, we will also see electrons scattered out to different angles. Um, and those angular distributions are caused by diffraction or scattering inside our sample. And that tells us a different information about our sample. And in a TM, we have access to both. We can certainly see an image and a diffraction pattern. Um, talk a little bit more about that in just a little bit. So that's one way to think about kind of scattering. So again, I'm waving my hands here. I haven't talked about what scattering is or why it happens, but we're, we're talking about that the electron hits our sample and and changes in some way, whether it's the intensity or, or the angular distribution. So spatial distribution or angular. If we look at this in a little, little, little more detail, we have to start thinking also, because we're illuminating our sample with waves, we need to think more than just angles or spatial distributions. We also have to think about the phase relationship of those waves. Are they coherently scattered waves or are they incoherently scattered? And coherent scattering is meaning that there's a very strong phase relationship between the initial illuminating, uh, the illuminating wave and then the exit wave that we can calculate the effect of those waves interacting inside our sample and, and actually get quantitative information about our sample. If we get into an incoherent regime, that means there's a weak or non-existing phase relationship and it's kind of, there's no good way of saying how that scattering all occurred. We can't really back calculate or piece it all together to figure out where that scattering came from in our sample. Um, and in, in TM, we're gonna have both. We're gonna have coherent scattered electrons, incoherent scattered electrons, which are not drawn here. And then we're gonna talk about elastic and inelastic. And hopefully throughout the other courses, I'm sure these terms have come up, but elastic is where we're conserving energy. And then inelastic scattering is where we're losing energy. So, so we have a bit of complexity in terms of the different signals coming out. Now in TM, we, we Again, we're only really concerned with the signals that are transmitted. If we compare to something like SEM, typically most of the signals coming out of our sample are incoherent uh, and they're all backscattered, meaning they come out of the surface back up towards the electron beam. There are backscattered electrons, which are different than what we're just gonna call generally backscattered signals. Um, so in the TM, because our samples are thin and our electron beams are very high energy, we start to have this coherent scattering with those phase relationships are preserved which is great because that gives us incredibly high resolution information about our sample we'll talk a little bit more about that so in kind of a slide is what do what information is contained by the elastically scattered electrons versus the inelastically scattered electrons so here we have a couple an image so all the images in the tm hopefully contain dominantly elastically scattered electrons and we so in this case, this is an incredibly high resolution image of strontium titanate. And I forget the orientation, but it's like a 110. Um, so we can see atomic structure of our sample. And this is an aberration corrected image. So the resolution is incredibly high. Uh, if we, we can also use our elastically scattered electrons to form diffraction patterns. In case this is a large angle convergent beam pattern, silicon, you can see it's as much science as it is art. Um, so our elastic signals are typically used to form images and diffraction patterns. Our inelastic signals are gonna be used to form the basis of the spectroscopies that we can do inside a TM. In this case, we have X-ray spectroscopy or what's called EDS, energy dispersive spectroscopy. In this case, we have an EELS uh, signal here, our electron energy loss spectroscopy. Uh, EDS is where we collect the X-rays and you can see that this is an atomic resolution EDS map. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the EELS map or the energy loss map is actually mapping plasmons between 
uh, I don't remember if these are gold or silver, I'm sorry, but some sort of metallic nano structure here. And this is the simulation. So you can see the experiment and simulation are, are pretty close. Um, so this is just to give you a sense of elastic versus inelastic and the different capabilities that we can use using those different electrons. Um, so if I, if I have a slide to talk about scattering, um, the slide would be basically scattering is a one year course. There's a lot that goes on when the electron interacts inside a long range ordered material or even a short range ordered material. There's a lot of waves to consider, a lot of optics to consider. Um, but we can also think about it in kind of a ballistic sense. Um, the Plinko game on The Price is Right, where you drop a puck and it dings around in a, some pegs and it you know, will end up at different places uh, at the bottom. And you know, those pegs are the atoms. And each time the puck hits, that's a scattering event. So we can draw a simple equation where we define the probability of the electron scattering from something inside our sample. And that's gonna be inversely related to the mean free path of the electron. And of course, as we're good stewards of the alphabet, we always recycle our, our, our letters here. So this is not wavelength, even though five slides ago, it was wavelength. So just be careful. I have a few notes here that it's not wavelength. Um, so the mean free path is basically how far an electron can travel before it scatters off something. And then we can relate that to some, some universal constants here of Avogadro's number. And then the, this term here, which is quite important, which is the cross section of an atom. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a second. We can also see it's gonna be related to the density of our, our sample or material, the thickness of our material, and then the atomic weight of the scattering atoms. So there, there are some actual physical units here that we can kind of think about. And again, not wavelength. So the probability of scattering, and we'll talk a little bit, uh, this equation we can use to, to a good effect to at least approximate some basics of, you know, scattering inside non-crystalline samples. Now, it always, this is from the latest edition of Williams and Carter, which always makes you feel a little bit better that, you know, some of these things are quite difficult to calculate in any, you know, super precise way. So the cross section and the mean free path at TM operating voltages, there's a lot of work to understand and quantify and better model those numbers. But for many material systems that aren't monoatomic systems, those numbers are approximations more than, than quantifications. So um, we can kind of visualize this if we draw a plot of mean free path uh, versus electron accelerating voltage or incident electron energy, same thing. Um, for a few very common monoatomic uh, samples here, um, what you can see is for something like gold, which is you know very dense, very heavy element, as we increase the accelerating voltage, the mean free path very weakly responds. Um, so here we're, let's say, let's say 25 nanometers, the mean free path, mean free path at 200 kV. So if our sample is 50 nanometers thick, we may have a couple different scattering events inside our sample before the electron actually leaves. And that's, that's being very hand wavy here. And ideally we want typically a 10th of a scattering event or a fifth of a scattering event to, to give us high resolution or images that we can interpret. Um, so, you know, if we look at carbon, you can say, oh, uh, my mean free path is 400 nanometers. My sample can be 400 nanometers thick. Yes, the electron beam will go through it, but it depends what you're trying to do. For high resolution imaging, again, we, we want that mean free, we want fractions of a mean free path inside our sample. So you can see something like gold that might be very difficult to do to get a sample that's two nanometers thick or even thinner, uh, similar to copper. And silicon, we can, you know, maybe a little easier. We can certainly make silicon samples down to 20 or 30 nanometers thick, and that will satisfy our fractions of the mean free path. Um, and you can see lighter elements. You can see that the slopes here start to increase as we go to lighter elements. So the in TM world, we always say we want the thinnest sample possible, but that will depend on the, the average Z, the density, other factors. And of course, the accelerating voltage, you know, 
again, we can keep pushing this out. We can go to 2 million volts and that, that may be one advantage of a 2 million volt microscope, it certainly is, is that we can go through thicker samples and still maintain high resolution. But again, you need to build an essentially a new building for your microscope. So um, I'm not gonna really discuss this in any detail. I just wanted to give you some uh, kind of rough ballparks of the order of magnitude of the cross section. So this is for aluminum uh, and you can see the accelerating voltages here. You can see it's kind of a weak effect um, so we have the cross section of something like plasmons, uh, elastically scattered electrons. These are the ionization events that generate X-rays from the L or K shells. And then secondary electrons, which would be more useful in something like an SEM. So um, just to give you some units here, um, calculating these and, and so that's where it gets a little more complicated, where we have to start thinking about these cross sections inside our sample. So that's why I'm skipping it. So now, Typically, when you read a TM textbook, you will have, uh, when they start talking about contrast, after you get through all the physics and the waves and optics and the math, they will start talking about contrast regimes. And those are typically defined as mass thickness contrast, diffraction contrast, and phase contrast. And then typically the STEM people will add Z contrast or HADF contrast or something to that effect, which is completely valid. Um, now, if you're working with polymers or materials that have no long range order that are typically amorphous or have only very short range order, some glasses and other things, typically mass thickness contrast is going to be the most important contrast mechanism. Of, of When we talk about contrast mechanism, we mean what is the contrast in my image? Where does it come from? Why is something dark? Why is something bright? And in between. So for amorphous materials, we can get away with only really considering mass thickness contrast. If we have long range ordered materials, we need to start worrying about diffraction contrast and phase contrast. And really most everything is related to diffraction inside our sample. And diffraction is a complicated subject. It depends on the ordering of our sample, the disordering of our sample, angles of or the orientations of our sample and many other factors. So that's where TM gets quite complicated but it also is where TM really shines. Is when we start to resolve the atomic structure of our sample, defects in the atomic structure of our sample, long range defects, higher order defects, you know, you know, linear defects, two dimensional defects, three dimensional defects. Uh, it's an extraordinarily powerful tool. Of course, again, it's the trade off is you get some complexity there and understanding how that diffraction contrast arises from the ordering the interaction of the electron beam and the, the crystalline sample. Um, and then phase contrast is kind of a special case in where we're considering coherent scattering inside our sample. And the way I always like to, you know, think about this or tell students to start thinking about this is kind of, you know, we talk about these parallel planar electron waves hitting our sample. They're scattering, they're generating new waves. Those waves are all interacting and, and and scattering off each other and interfering with each other and then we get this exit wave and if it's all coherent that exit wave is directly related or at least are directly relatable to the atomic structure of our sample so phase contrast is kind of like if you have a completely placid lake and you build with connects you, your virtual atomic lattice and drop that in the lake and the ripple patterns you would see on the surface would interfere in such a way that it would be related to the connect structure you dropped into the Phase contrast is kind of a special case of diffraction, and, and we'll talk a little bit about z-contrast for STEM. Um, so what is, if I have, can show you these different contrast regimes in a couple pictures or a few pictures. So for mass thickness contrast, I, I've chosen the example of an unstained yeast cell. And so a yeast cell is gonna be primarily low z materials, carbons, oxygens, hydrogens, nitrogens, Things that aren't very high Z, the density is typically very low. The thickness we can control pretty carefully using prep techniques. Um, and what this means is our probability of scattering is gonna be pretty low if we just have low Z materials, low density materials, and small thickness materials. And this is a good example. So this is a yeast cell. And you can see that, you know, some regions where we start to see some contrast, you know, this is bright, this is dark but the overall contrast is incredibly poor. Again, that's because without, so I should 
say with, without scattering, we have no information. So scattering is good up until a point. We need scattering. If we have too much scattering, then we have a problem. So in this case, we have too little scattering and the information we get is quite limited. If I stain this by adding heavy elements, like in this case, uranium or lead, I can directly start to increase the, the overall, you know, mass thickness. In this case, the overall mass gets very, very high. The scattering probability goes way up. And I start to see, this is the same structure, by the way. These are different cells, but the same cells. You can see very fine details, tiny little clusters of, I'm not a biologist, I'm sorry. I don't know what these all are. I forget my biology from high school, uh, but quite a bit of detail that not present in the unstained sample because here we had very little contrast here we have sufficient contrast to start to image the different structures inside our sample we're, we're enhancing the the mass contrast in this case the thickness is constant what this looks like in terms of the optics is we illuminate our sample uh, if we have a higher mass thickness we're going to get more scattering and that scattering in this case we're drawing out to higher angles um, on the lower mass thickness side, we're gonna get less scattering. So most of our intensity is gonna be in the direct beam. So what we're showing here is that we have our electron beam. Uh, right now, our direct beam is parallel to this imaginary line, which is called the optic axis, which runs in the center of the lenses inside our microscope. If we have very weak scattering, almost all of our electrons are grouped inside this direct beam, which is weakly scattered beam. Then we focus that using our objective lens and we pass that to our imaging system. And our brightness will be higher here because most of our signal just goes right through our sample. There's no real scattering, just a little bit. When we have very strong scattering, most of that signal is scattered out to different angles in this drawing. Um, if we have some sort of field limiting or objective aperture, which is typical in TM imaging, some of that scattered signal will actually be physically blocked so the number of electrons is actually going to be lower going through our sample and then we'll get dark image on that from that so higher mass thickness gives rise to darker contrast and lower mass thickness gives rise to weaker contrast or brighter contrast so the, in the example i showed we had different masses but we can also do the same thing with thickness if our sample is not a uniform thickness which is typical Thicker parts will be darker and thinner parts will be brighter. Uh, diffraction contrast, th there's no way to really discuss this in any detail, um, at least in an introduction slide, but basically if you have a crystalline sample, you will get Bragg diffraction because we're illuminating our sample with waves, just as we do with neutrons and x-rays, electrons will diffract. And then as diffraction will change based on the orientation of our sample, the different crystal structures in our sample, if those crystal structures have different crystal spacings or despacings, if the beam tilt, the electron tilt is changing or the electron wavelength is changing or the thickness of our sample is changing and many other things, the contrast in our sample will change depending on how fully we're satisfying Bragg's law of diffraction here. Um, a good note is that all samples exhibit mass thickness contrast, but only long range, short range and long range ordered materials exhibit strong diffraction contrast. So again, if you're working on amorphous samples, mass thickness contrast is really all you need to worry about typically. For crystalline samples, we have a lot more to worry about, but the beauty of TM is that one, it's a transmission technique. We're looking through our sample. And so we can start to see defect structures inside our sample. And this is very useful working in metals, ceramics. Um, a lot of information can be had. Um, phase contrast, I've kind of already talked about this a little bit, kind of this interference pattern, a coherent interference pattern. And that gives us typically what we define as high resolution TM images. In this case, we, we have two different cerium oxide structures or two different orientations, excuse me. Uh, this is an aberration corrective platform. Uh, so we can start to see cerium and oxygen atoms and you know, kind of high resolution TM image is what we call our phase contrast. So I've talked about most of this, but one thing I want to point out is that before aberration correction, we, we typically needed to use computer simulations and we still do to, to interpret our images. Aberration correction helps reduce that quite a bit. So aberration correction, not just about improving resolution, it's about improving interpretability of our structures. 
Um, and I, most of this talk is kind of considering TM, TM techniques, but STEM, I'd be remiss to say that STEM is not, STEM is one of the more powerful techniques these days. It's certainly one of the more versatile techniques. And I'll, I'll hopefully in two slides, we'll convince you of that. Um, I do want to point out a, kind of the fourth contrast regime, which I, I mentioned a little bit is Z contrast in the STEM. In STEM mode, just like SEM, we illuminate our sample with a little some tiny probe. And then below our sample, we can insert different detectors, which can collect out to different angles when we have incoherent scattering out to higher angles, you know, to the 50 milliradians or above, which is about, what, two degrees, um, we can start to get information. The, the contrast in our sample is roughly related to Z squared. What I mean by that is we start to get Z contrast. And here's a good example. This is a TM image of a germanium layer, germanium doped silicon. In the TM image, it, there's no real information telling us where the germanium is. Um, if we take the same sample and image it in using high angle annular dark field electrons, we can now start to see that the germanium signal is brighter than the silicon signal. We can still see the atomic structure. Not, not very good, but we can start to see where the germanium is in the silicon due to that Z contrast mechanism. Um, we can start to detect things like single atoms or you know a few atoms of dopants inside our material, in this case, antimony atoms doped inside silicon. So this is a antimony free region. And then the antimony source was turned on during the growth. And you can start to see antimony atoms kind of speckling the silicon lattice here. Um, and this is all because of that Z contrast. Now, one of the reasons why STEM is so, so amazing is that you can do a lot at the same time. So a good example of this is we illuminate our sample with a little probe we start to scatter angles, uh, scatter electrons out to uh, all sorts of different angles. We can collect the high angle ones. We can let, collect ones scattered out to different angles. We can also collect the energy loss signal at the same time. We can also collect the EDS or X-ray signal at the same time, all simultaneously. So we can get four or five or six data sets from the same sample during the same microscope session, um, which is incredibly powerful. So STEM is, used a lot more these days than it was 10 or even 20 years ago. And STEM is kind of dominating right now because of that incredible versatility and improvements in optics and resolution of the system. So um, I wish I had more time to talk about STEM, but let's keep going because I want to get you some examples. So what can we do with the STEM? Most people always think about TM in terms of high resolution imaging, where we start to look at the atomic structure. And that's an incredibly powerful component or capability of a TM or a STEM. Because again, as material scientists, we can start to look at the structure property relationships from the atomic link scale and work our way back up to the macro scale. Now, of course, people will disagree with that because we're looking at very tiny areas, but um, there, there, there's a lot of utility to be able to look at the atomic structure of a sample. And in these days, the atomic chemistry and atomic body. So there's a couple examples here, pulled from Williams and Carter. Uh, this is a some sort of twin boundary in, sorry, it's Spinel. Um, down here, this is strontium titanate, a low angle grain boundary, so you can see dislocations. This is the uncorrected version. And then after imaging with the corrector, you can see the difference in terms of the signal noise ratio in terms of the resolution massively improved so high resolution tm incredibly important we can also use tms just to image other samples we don't have to be at super high resolutions we can just be at higher resolution than an optical microscope and there's no real limit to the kinds of samples we can look at in a tm metals ceramics polymers biological samples proteins you name it it's been imaged in a tm um, so this is an example back when I was at Virginia Tech working with Dr. Ozzie Lane. They're working on hydrogen gas separation membranes um, using block copolymer, self-assembled structures. And so you can see this kind of beautiful lamella swirling around. Um, for the other lab managers, it's also a great way to punish the users who keep breaking your microscopes. You draw an arrow up here that says start. You draw an arrow down here that says exit and you make them complete the maze. <laughs> That's a joke. We don't punish our users. We love them. So what else can you do in a TM besides imaging? You can, of course, do diffraction. And this is incredibly powerful because we have access to both the image plane and the back focal plane where we can take an image, 
with a push of a button, we can look at the diffraction pattern. And the diffraction pattern contains a wealth of information that may not be immediately visible in the image. Information about the structure, the space group, the spacings, disorder inside our crystal, long range ordering, many things which are invisible or very hard to see in our image are very clearly visible in the diffraction pattern. And again, this is a push of a button. So in a single session, we can have imaging and diffraction all correlated from the same region inside our sample. Um, and so these are a few different examples. Um, pretty, uh, pretty useful one is this is kind of a standard what we call selected area diffraction pattern or spot pattern in TEM. This is the same exact structure, but now with a convergent beam pattern. Um, and these kind of convergent beam patterns contain a far greater magnitude of information than just the selected area pattern. These are kind of the default diffraction patterns you'll see in papers. Um, but there's a lot more information here that can be gleaned, like again, space groups, strain, all sorts of things. So there's a lot of information we can get from, from reciprocal space inside our sample. Um, I've kind of already mentioned this, so we can look at defects. I want to show you a pretty cool example. This is uh, some sort of uh, uh, defect source emitting dislocations, dislocation source, excuse me. Uh, emitting dislocations out. You can kind of see them wiggling around, getting caught up, tangled up. So uh, this is done in the TM, obviously. So if you're working on imaging defects, whether it's dislocations or planar defects, a TM is incredibly powerful. We get a lot of cotton. We can adjust the microscope so we get incredible contrast from those defects. Um, Eels, I want to briefly mention eels. Uh, so I'm going to skip the hardware and talk a little bit about what we can do with eels. Uh, EELS allows us, it's a much higher energy resolution technique than something like EDS. We have um, tons, a uh, hundred to a thousand times more energy resolution than typically X-ray spectroscopy. So we can start to look at things like phonons and, and they say usually not accessible. That's not true anymore. We have uh, enough energy resolution. This thing looks at phonon structures of our sample. Uh, we can look at things like band gaps. We can look at plasmons. I showed you an example of that. We can look at uh, inner shell or core excitations, looking at the valence state of cations inside our sample, whether they're two plus or three plus. Um, incredibly powerful technique. I want to give a shout out to one of our graduate students, stu superstars here at NC State. Aubrey Penn just had this paper published. Um, they're working on multi-layered um, thin films, oxide thin films, LSMO, LSCO. Uh, chromates and manganates. And so here's a high resolution HADIF image and then an EELS map showing the kind of intermixing of the chromium and, and manganese inside her sample. So EELS in, so this is the mixing, but you can also look again at the valence state and look at the oxidation states of those chromium and, and manganese cations. Um, so EELS is incredibly powerful bonding and chemistry at the atomic link scale. Uh, EDS is, you know, a lot of students want to do EDS in the SEM and they're, they don't understand that the resolution of EDS in the SEM is limited not by the electrons probe size, but it's limited by the sample interaction volume. In TM, our interaction volume is very small because we're working with thin samples. And we can start to do things like atomic resolution EDS if we have nice samples. So this is done by Jim LeBeau and his students here in, who was at NC State, now at MIT. Um, so this is a raw data collection of strontium, titanium, and oxygen uh, maps in strontium titanate, EDS maps, excuse me, in strontium titanate, and then the smooth kind of versions here. So we can do EDS down to the atomic link scale. Again, atomic chemistry. Um, what's newest or newish in the, the field is these kind of 4D STEM techniques where we, we operate in STEM mode, we scan a small little probe over our sample, and instead of integrating signal, what we do is we collect the convergent beam electron diffraction pattern, and we now have detectors that can collect the full dynamic range of that pattern, and then we can start to calculate or, or use math to calculate the phase and amplitude of the wave that contributes to that diffraction pattern. And that lets us do things like arbitrary imaging of our sample, so we have a diffraction pattern, we can generate whatever masking we want. We can add a virtual bright field detector, a virtual annular dark field detector, a virtual annular bright field detector, or non-annular 
apertures, detectors, anything we want because we can start to play with that full dynamic range pattern. And so the example of a HADIF image, a calculated or reconstructed bright field image, dark field image, an angular bright field image, you can start to see the oxygen or light elements start to appear in that angular bright field image. So you can collect a data set and spend months or years reconstructing an almost infinite amount of data from that data set. You can do things like orientation imaging. So in this case is mapping out different orientations. I believe this was a peptide. Forgive me if I misremembered. Uh, you can start to look at strain and I think this is probably pretty hard to see. Uh, these are hundreds or thousands of multi-layered materials and this is the strain map. So you can look at the strain uh, over a very long range area. Or you can do some interesting things where you start to look at the electric fields in space charge. Uh, densities inside samples in real space. So this is an example. This is an image of strontium titanate. This is a map. So each one of these little dots inside here is a the seabed pattern. And if you look very closely, you'll start to see the, this is a single unit cell of strontium titanate. So you can see the cations very weakly. And then you can calculate the electric field distribution. You can do the same thing for a non-central symmetric oxide like bismuth ferrite and you can start to see the electric field is non-central symmetric as it should be then from there you can start to calculate real space charge density and so here's the experiment here uh, in strontium titanate and here's the simulation and then here's the experiment in bismuth ferrite and here's the simulation and this was done by Wenpei Gao who's now a brand new professor here at NC State um, so these 40 stem techniques it's, that's just brushing the surface. There's a lot we can do with those, certainly. Uh, tomography, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip a little bit about that, but tomography is three-dimensional reconstructions. And this is a block copolymer system I wanna show. Uh, in the, it's actually transforming between two different conformations here. So we have kind of a linear or lamella structure here and then a more complicated structure. So we can, using tomography, we can both resolve the two different copolymers and we can start to resolve the different conformations of those polymers. So that's an incredibly powerful technique. Cryo-TM, as probably most of you have heard, is, is booming. It is a revolution in structural biology. It is happening right in front of our eyes. A good example of the revolution taking place is the resolution of cryo-TM when looking at proteins in about, what, six, seven years ago was what was called blobology, where we had a general sense of the shape of a protein, but very little about the actual structure. And then now, and this was a couple of years ago, we're down to the, we can reconstruct atomic level, atomic resolution level images of proteins. And so cryo-TM is exploding, especially in structural biology. Um, in situ, I'm gonna skip some of this in the interest of time. In situ just means we can start to build little labs inside our TM where we can apply electric fields, magnetic fields, strains, heating, cooling, flow liquids, flow gases, poke and prod our sample, all inside the TM with the benefits of that incredible spatial resolution of the TM. Okay, so I'm getting close to the end here and I know I'm running late. So what can we not do with the TM? First, image interpretation is quite difficult. And this is kind of the prototypical example in Williams and Carter of misinterpreting your image. So when we go to the zoo, we see this, we know this is just two rhinos, one standing in front of the other. But the joke here, or the punchline is that when we, you know, when we see this image, we laugh, but when we see the equivalent inside the TM, we publish. There's a lot of, you know, TM is inherently a two-dimensional technique. So when we start to have materials overlapping, especially if they're crystalline or we don't have a lot of knowledge of our sample, we can start to get artifacts which are not real at all. So th this is an example of more interference. These are little silver nano triangles. You can see where a couple of them overlap at just the right angles. We get this really interference, re really nice interference pattern, which is not real at all. It has no information, excuse me, very little information about the sample. Um, and certainly not real atoms, which is what the student thought when he first took the picture. So, um, when we're operating at really high voltages, we tend to do a lot of damage to our sample. So these are some gas bubbles and quartz. When we look at things like cells, so based on the electron dose, we can start to completely destroy our sample. So this is kind of a pristine sample. And then after a little bit of dose, you start to see bubbles. 
forming in our sample. If we're looking at things like cellulose nanocrystals, you know, our first images may look good. After a few seconds, here you can see the diameter of the electron beam. And you can see everything inside that illumination path is basically destroyed relative to the cellulose nanocrystals around it. Um, here's some carbon nanotubes. This is a single wall carbon nanotube at 300 kV. 10 seconds, it's destroyed. At lower voltage, it can be imaged for 20 minutes and stay intact. So there's a lot of damage we do in the TEM. Sometimes we can use that to our advantage. We can do little nanoscale drill press, drill a hole in graphene or silicon nitride and use those to thread DNA through. Um, we can also draw, I'll add a Rudolph nose here, pretty uh, uninteresting emojis, very, very rudimentary emojis here. Uh, that are quite expensive when your advisor gets the bill. Uh, we can deposit contamination on the surface, which is not limited to TM, any electron microscopy technique. Um, but in TM, since our beams are very bright, that's even more, even worse for us. And the biggest limitation really is sample preparation. We need thin samples, and we need samples that are representative of our structure. Um, that's not trivial to do. So. I, I like this summary of the ideal TM specimen in order of most important to, to, to least is our sample actually has to be representative of the structure. If the sample we prepare is not representative, then all the data we're generating has no use. Um, sample has to be thin. And when we say thin, typically from you know single atom thick to 20 nanometers to 100 nanometers, depending on our sample. Um, Preparing samples is easy. If you're working on you know, nanoparticles or nanowires, you put a little droplet on a thin support membrane, in this case, a silicon nitride membrane. If you have bulk samples, you're gonna spend a lot of time gluing, cutting, gluing, cutting, gluing, cutting, grinding, polishing, more grinding and polishing, and then iron milling and hope you hit the area and hope your area survived and hope it's thin enough. Um, so, not fun. For soft samples, you can use what's called a microtome, which uses a glass or diamond knife to cut very thin sections. Um, for you know, polymers, biological samples, this works really well. That's also not easy though. Um, you may also spend a million dollars or so to buy a dual beam or what focused ion beam, which is the one here we have in NC State where we can use some sort of liquid metal ion like gallium to kind of nano scalpel our sample and lift out TM samples, uh, which is far more common these days than it used to be. Uh, and so if I can summarize, STEM is amazing because it has extremely high spatial resolution. We can start to image atomic structures. We can collect chemical and bonding information from the atomic link scale. The price we pay for that Resolution is that it's quite complicated technique to operate the microscope and understand where the information in our image is coming from. And TM is 95% sample prep, really. Um, the, the rate limiting step in terms of getting data out of the microscope is getting a sample into the microscope, a good sample. Um, and so to advertise all the other universities, uh, we have a slide here that talks about the TM. These are TM specific. Uh, TM facilities at University of Madison, Wisconsin, uh, UIC, NC State, Minnesota, Penn State, uh, has all the contacts, emails, um, and all the different capabilities. So with that, I apologize for going over. Hopefully we have time for questions. Yes, I think we do, Chris. There's a few questions. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, from this slide, it looks like we're all sending a lot of money to Thermo Fisher every year, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> who make very good microscopes. So. Uh, give them a plug but yeah I've got a few a few questions to ask here um, the first one is how can we differ electron diffraction for polycrystalline material with an amorphous material sure that's a great question so if you have a polycrystalline sample you will have long-range order so you'll have individual grains and each grain has long-range ordering and then you'll have rotation or grain boundaries connecting the grains and so you'll have the same structures, but they'll be rotated in some, some effect, whether it's in plane, out of plane, or some combination above. So if you have hundreds or thousands or millions of little crystals, and they all have the same crystal structure, what we do is essentially take a spot pattern from a single grain 
and we start to rotate that. So instead of a beautiful little spot pattern, you'll start to get a ring pattern. And the rings will be extremely sharp and extremely bright because essentially what we're doing is rotationally averaging a single spot across all the different orientations that those different grains may have. Whereas in an amorphous material, you only have short range ordering. There's no real long range ordering. And so your spots, if you have any spots or rings at all, they will be incredibly diffuse, very broad, not sharp at all. So it's a very dramatic difference between a polycrystalline diffraction pattern and an amorphous. If you have something in between, you'll have some combination of broad amorphous rings in your diffraction pattern and sharp either spots or, or, or crystalline rings inside your, your pattern, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one was actually two parts. I think you've already addressed the first one. It was, it was before you started talking about sample prep, but the second part of his question is a little more information about the lens for the electron beam. So what, what are these lenses oh, great question, yeah. made of? How, how do they operate? Yeah, so basically in a TM, we have three or four major lens stacks. So above the sample, we have what's called the condenser lens. And that has either three or four different components. But basically what the condenser lens does is one controls the demagnification of the electron source when we're doing stem or controls NTM mode as well. So basically it controls how much electron signal makes it from the first condenser or into the imaging system into the next set of lenses. So we can control the spot size or the brightness of our electron beam by adjusting the first condenser lens. The next condenser allows us to control the area we're illuminating. You know, if we go to very low mag, we want to illuminate maybe a millimeter of our sample. If we go to very high mag, we may only want to illuminate a nanometer of our sample. So the second condenser lens allows us to adjust the illumination range or diameter. At the same time, both the condenser lenses control the convergence angle. So that's a bit more complicated to explain. Um, then, so basically the, convert, the condenser system controls, it makes our, controls the brightness that illuminates onto our sample. We control the area. The objective lens actually forms the image in TM mode. In STEM mode, it forms a probe, depending on our optical setup. And then the rest below the sample, the rest of the lenses, which would be the intermediates, diffraction, and basically what we call the projector system, serve to magnify either the image in TM mode or controls the magnification of the diffraction pattern in STEM mode. Um, okay. I don't, hopefully that answers at least in a basic level. Yeah, yeah, and I'll ask one more question. Um, and then, um, you know, actually a couple, somebody had asked about your notes and I would say just contact Chris in, in, offline, his email's on the screen if you would like access to his notes and he can make a decision on that. But the last question is, what does the instrument do differently between selected area diffraction and convergent beam electron diffraction, i.e. how are the optics set up differently? Great question. So in selected area diffraction, what we do is we illuminate our sample with a parallel beam. So we're illuminating some physical area of our sample, let's say a hundred nanometer diameter uh, illumination, hopefully with a parallel beam. We can insert some sort of limiting aperture, which further reduces the area we're, we're selecting. So we can physically select some part of our sample, whether say we want to look at a grain boundary, we can move an aperture and select that grain boundary and we're illuminating with a parallel beam, we hit diffraction mode. What we do is we look in the back focal plane is now projected and that selected area diffraction pattern is gonna be composed of spots because our beam is parallel. And I didn't mention this, but the spot size is related to the convergence angle. So if our convergence angle is close to zero, our spots will be very, very sharp and bright and, and, and small. In convergent beam mode, when we're putting a probe onto our sample, that's essentially what we're doing in convergent beam mode is we're converging the electron beam into a probe. And when we do that, we're increasing the convergence angle. And instead of having sharp, bright spots in our back focal plane, what we'll start to have is disks. And I'm going to quickly, oops, oh, I will reshare my screen in one second. Sorry, let me just scroll up here and reshare. Okay. While you're doing that, the last thing I was going to say after that is that the, the, this Friday uh, webinar is going to be on small angle x-ray scattering for those of you who are so uh, interested in that. So, so can, you, can you guys see this? Yes, yeah. we can. Okay. Yep. So this is a selected area pattern where we're illuminating with a parallel beam. And typically we're limited to a few hundred nanometer region. So there, there's a downside. We can't really get a selected area pattern. You can with fancy nanobeam techniques, but 
generally speaking, a few hundred nanometers. Whereas this is a convergent beam pattern. This is actually the same material. So here we have sharp, bright spots. Here we actually have disks. You see it's the exact same symmetry, this symmetry here. Um, the, our spots are much larger because we're converging our beam. The, so that gives us this large disk, but we can actually do convergent beam electron diffraction from volumes as small as, you know, as less than a nanometer. So we can collect diffraction from a tiny volume, whereas here we're limited to diffraction from a much larger volume. But this is much easier to interpret. So, so those are the basic differences between selected area and convergent beam diffraction.